everyone, welcome to the Survival Show podcast, where it's our job to take you step by step through the mindset, skills, tactics, gear, and supplies you need to survive almost any crisis, disaster, or life altering event. Today, I'm really excited. We have a special guest with us today, Mr. Andy, Tom, Andy. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. So if you guys don't know, about two years ago, yeah, maybe, yeah, it was about two years ago, I came up with, first I had the tiny survival guide. Mm -hmm. Then I, I knew that I had to come up with a first aid guide. And in fact, people were like, hey, why don't you come up with a first aid guide? So I came up with a tiny first aid guide. We have some first aid kits that will be rolling out soon. And I'd like to say that Andy consulted me on the tiny first aid guide, but he did not. <laughs> I met, I actually met Still Andy. It looks good though, it looks I, good. I actually met you right about the time I think we were publishing it. Mm -hmm. And Andy's my trainer. He's he's trained me in first aid, uh, stop the bleed, all of that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And Andy, I'm just so happy to have you here. You. Andy's had 33 years of first responder, uh, first aid training experience. And so what I like to do before we get into this is say, smash that like button and make sure that you subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on any of the future first aid podcasts because hopefully Andy likes doing this enough and we'll have him back. And what we're gonna do is we're kinda gonna use the tiny first aid guide as an outline, but we're gonna leverage your 33 years of experience to really help us, give us an anecdotes and stories on why people need to be more prepared in a, in a medical way. And what we're gonna focus in on here, Andy, it, I think where we're gonna center around is why should people be medically prepared and then what are the first steps they can take like right now to uh, kind of buffer themselves against a potential accident or a disaster emergency. I mean, you were just telling me a story before this about something you were involved in, when was it, yes, yesterday? Uh, Saturday night. Saturday night and you didn't get any sleep. Yeah, no, no sleep. <laughs> But hey, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and give us some of your backstory. Tell us, you know, yeah. why did you love teddy bears so much that you decided to save people's lives all the time or what? Well, well, Dave, <laughs> first of all, thanks for inviting me. And I, I, I thank the listeners for, uh, for tuning into the, the podcast. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of my background. So I've been a paramedic actually for 33 years. How did I get there? Very interesting story okay, that uh, yeah. I'm excited to actually tell you about. Um, I started off actually as a counselor. I did uh, counseling for drug abuse teens uh, at an organization okay. in Pennsylvania. Uh, and during that time, I, while I was going through high school before actually uh, counseling, uh, we had a group of teens that always had a competition who could do better at different things. So one day while I was counseling, we popped up and said, hey, what can we do to, to compete? So we were watching, I think it was Rescue 911 or something, one of them rescue shows way back when, 33 okay. years ago, and uh, said, that EMT course, let's let's compete. Let's go take that EMT course and see who, who does the best. So that started it. Oh, okay. Uh, we, yeah, we started off uh, with the EMT course. I did well. Um, I actually, the my first clinical rotation I have. So what I was had, this? Was, was this just like a... A challenge that you had with some buddies? It was absolutely like, who, a challenge. Because <laughs> taking an EMT course is no small deal. No, it I mean, wasn't. It's a pretty I mean, significant it's a, commitment. Yeah, it's, it's a four-month course. Yeah. Uh, Were but, you the only one that completed it? No, we uh, actually all completed it. Really? I'm not going to okay. say I was the top of all of us. <laughs> uh, I didn't finish first, uh, but I did well. I did very well. Uh, so I continued my career in counseling and stuff. And uh, one one time, one day, my, my brother-in-law... Uh, came to me and said, hey, there's a, an EMT job after I, I got my certification. There's an EMT job down in the Hershey area. Are you interested? And I was like, no, I don't think so. You know, this counseling thing was going pretty good for me at the time. And I really didn't think I wanted to change careers. So here's the, I guess, funny part of the story, but not so funny part of the story. Uh, one day I had a, a client uh, that I was counseling that didn't like a decision I made for him. Uh, and we were playing a softball game and I actually got hit and I have a scar above my eye here. I actually got <laughs> hit with a baseball bat, uh, actually put me, uh, unconscious in the hospital. 
And I remember waking up with my I can see it now. I know. I can, I can definitely see it when the light is. We didn't do the makeup like... over it. We didn't do any makeup. <laughs> and I, I remember waking up. My brother-in-law was there that initially said, you want to get in the EMS? And I looked at him and said, about that EMS job, I think I want out of counseling now. And that was actually hmm. the start. Okay. And I moved into the Hershey area. That's where I started my career. Uh, started as an EMT. Uh, did that for about a year before I went to paramedic school. Uh, and right out of paramedic school, the majority of my career has actually been in management. I've done management for uh, well over half of those years, uh, actually. Uh, but I you know, started off in uh, the Hershey area as a manager. So and, like manage, tell me what managing yeah. is in relation to like paramedics and yeah. emergency so, services. So I managed actually a paramedic unit. Uh, okay. Actually, it was in Palmyra, Pennsylvania, uh, right near Hershey. Well, you got, kind of got to know what you're doing to be able to do that. Well, it was, yeah. I'm not going to say, I, back then I knew exactly <laughs> what I was doing, but you know, we, you we figured we, it out. We, we, after, after 33 years, I think I figured it out now at least. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I started the career there, uh, got into working at Hershey. Uh, worked for every, pretty much everywhere down there, Lebanon County, Hershey, Harrisburg area, uh, Lancaster area. And there's the big medical center down there too, right? There is, the Hershey yeah. Med Center and wonderful hospital. I, I wasn't paid by Hershey to say that, but it's a wonderful center. Uh, I loved it down there. But yeah, so I uh, worked for there for many years. Uh, and believe it or not, I thought back in 2001, I wanted to end my career in EMS and get out of it. But I hate to say, once you're in it, you can never get out of it. Mm. And I actually moved up into our area and bought a restaurant. Okay. And did a little bit of a career change, which lasted about four months. I didn't know this about I the restaurant. Did. Yes. Right. What you guys don't know is, uh, in our <laughs> we we fellowship in the same church, mm -hmm. local church. And uh, what you guys don't know is that we have men's retreats and stuff like that and camping trips for the teens and andy is usually in charge of cooking and it's awesome i didn't know that it started with a restaurant it did though. it did start as a restaurant uh i had it for four months okay and decided that was the biggest mistake in my really? life okay yes and i really missed the ms so i ended up uh <laughs> traveling two and a half hours to go back to uh the hershey area to uh pursue you know my career in, in paramedic again uh, until something opened up in our area. And ever since then, uh, 02, I got hired in our area as a paramedic and as a manager. And, you know, been done, been doing, you know, managing a paramedic, a paramedic unit since. Nice. And haven't turned back. Uh, there's, uh, I, I'm not actually doing it full time now, but I'm still dabbling in it. I, yeah. Like I said, I was working a shift on Saturday, so I'm still doing it because I, I really enjoy you know, helping people, uh, it gives you, it's it's one of the best jobs that gives you great satisfaction yeah. being able to help somebody. So my understanding is that you, I mean, being a manager, <coughs> you've actually made the decision to be boots on the ground and, and be part of a paramedic unit. What What is yeah. it, one or two days a week or something like that? Yeah, I, right now so I do about, call. yeah, about one or two days. I actually uh, do like a, either an eight or 12 hour shift. Okay. Yeah. So no, definitely. I want to keep my certification up. Took a lot to get it. Don't really want to get rid of it. So, right. but you know, and in that time, uh, I've taken on multiple uh, different instructorships, uh, including like first aid, uh, CPR. I do stop the bleed classes, uh, and I teach uh, numerous of advanced classes too for paramedics as well. Okay. Uh, as nice. well as I forgot, I'm actually, actually an EMT instructor as well. Okay. So, yeah. nice. Yeah. And imagine that keeps you busy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember first hearing about you. I remember Joe. Our buddy Joe, who's, oh, yeah, yeah, who's yeah, been yeah. on the, yeah. some of our videos, yeah. um, mentioned you. I think the first time was, didn't you guys do a canoe trip like about two years ago? We two. did one two years ago and actually repeated it last year. Okay. Uh, uneventful each time, thank goodness, <laughs> except sore legs and a, a, some a little bit of sunburn at the end of it. But yeah, uneventful trips. Right. Good times. Yeah. Well, that's really good. That's really good. And then uh, currently, <laughs> you still, you still, you actually, have worked and you still work in the hospital system, right? Yes, that's so UPMC. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, we allowed to say that. Uh, I guess. <laughs> yes. I'll let you cut it out. Yeah. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'll find out. Um, well, good, good. And what do you currently do if you're allowed to talk about it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, with the system that I'm in, we run what they call a MICU. It's a mobile intensive intensive care unit. Okay. Uh, which is basically an EMT and a paramedic. So I act as the paramedic. So I take the more advanced calls. 
And if it's a, a basic call, the EMT takes that and we take turns. Uh, but yeah, so we respond to uh, our whole county. We're, in, we're responsible for the whole county of Tioga uh, with the paramedic service at least. Uh, there's multiple basic life support services throughout Tioga County, which do a wonderful job for being volunteers. Uh, but yeah, we handle the advanced part uh, of it. So, okay. Yeah. Good. So here's my question for you. Yeah. Being Having trained people for so long, and uh, I know it's your great, great, at least I have sensed it, it's your great desire to get as many people medically prepared mm -hmm. and first aid prepared. Um, but what do you have to say about like how, maybe just talk about the importance of being medically prepared, you know, maybe in relation to the times that we live in now yeah. and what you're maybe even go to, if you want to, uh, let's just say we have some catastrophic, you know, catastrophic, right. uh, life altering events or society altering events. Uh, maybe bring that into perspective for yeah. people why they really need to like not turn this podcast off and, and really listen up for this series. Oh, absolutely. Definitely, definitely leave the podcast on because you're going to learn a lot. I have a feeling. Uh, I, I'll tell you the being ready, the readiness is, is very important. Uh, my concern right now is, you know, so many little things can happen even in the home around the house. Uh, you know, we have elderly parents sometimes, you know, we've got kids that, you know, can swallow things. Uh, seconds count. It's not, you don't, sometimes in different scenarios, you don't have a lot of time to get to the hospital. You need to be the medical person. Uh, yeah. Which, and having the basic knowledge can definitely help sustain life until, you know, the more advanced get there. Uh, I'll tell you the one, the one program that I, I work with that really brings us, I think, full circle and brings it to light is the whole uh, Stop the Bleed program. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. In, in talking about Stop the Bleed, it was a program uh, that came out in around 2012 uh, after some school shootings and stuff. And many person, many, many people got you know killed over those those incidences. Uh, and what was found that you know by the time the police were able to get into those uh, those schools to to help the people, it was too late because the medical people couldn't actually get in there right away because they had to wait till it was a safe environment. Uh, so they came up with Stop the Bleed, which is to teach the, the lay person or the general public basic techniques that actually can save lives and help, you know, sustain life until, you know, more medical trained people can actually get there. So it's the same thing, I think, in the home. You know, there's so many different scenarios. You know, mom and dads are getting old. Uh, like I said, there's children. Uh, just in different environmental emergencies and things, you There's know, people you, who wreck their motorcycles on wreck their, yeah, wreck their <laughs> motorcycles. Yep. We've seen those. Uh, but you know, look at common medical problems nowadays, mm. strokes, diabetes, heart attacks, right. more and more and more common, you know, having just a basic knowledge of how to treat those people, you could save their life. Yeah. So, and I think that's, you know, eventually what we're going to talk about, you know, as we go through the, as you, as you go through your program here. Uh, but just those base that basic knowledge is really is really that will help you know uh, keep your loved ones alive, and I think that's what's important. Why, why it's so important to have just a, even a basic knowledge, you know, and it might be something you want to advance in, and it, it is a great career. It's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. So it might be something that somebody might want to advance in. How many lives have you saved? Wow. <laughs> wow. It's probably uh, hard to quantify. It huh? is very hard. In thirty three years, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, you know. I've been there. You've heard the the people say I've been there, seen it, did it all. I've definitely been there, seen it, pretty much did it all. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's it was rewarding. And you know, unfortunately, you do lose you lose a few, but mm. the ones that you do save, that especially when they come back to you and, and mm. give you a big hug or a right. Christmas card, right. Uh, right. it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah you yeah. don't want to you don't want you want to keep that knowledge. That's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah. So when we talk about preparedness a lot. <coughs> What I'm finding is people want to talk about two things, bug out bags, one, <laughs> and food, right? So on this podcast, we really like to focus in on just a general, uh, we call it the survival rule of threes or the rule of three. And that is just, it's based on threes, like three minutes, three minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks. So We've got two things that fall into which really actually gets back to first aid and first response and being medically prepared mm -hmm. in the three minutes 
And that would be, we've got to keep oxygen flowing and blood flowing properly through our bodies, right? And the brain, yep. Absolutely. And the brain, yep. And uh, then if we wanted to go further, then, you know, three hours, we need to regulate our core body temperature, right? So mm -hmm. that's shelter and all that. So then we have three, three days. And I mean, you're at a critical point if you're not hydrated for three days, mm -hmm. right? We want to keep hydrating. And then three weeks, we start getting into the food concerns. Mm. Um, so getting back to this, you know, starting from what's going to kill you first, right? What's going to kill you first, Andy? Well, <laughs> <laughs> in this in this list, yeah, <laughs> not uh, a trick. It's not a trick question. No, yeah. I I think what's really important uh, is your environment. You know, number one, core temperatures. You know, temperatures is very important. Yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use I'm gonna use two. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna use you know, uh, temperature. I'm gonna use hydration and food. Okay. Uh, you know, temperature number one, your your core temperature can drop quite quickly if you're in the wrong environment, or it could increase right. quite quickly if you're in a too hot of an environment. And trauma will cause your core body to and absolutely in both ways, whether you're you're cold or hypothermic or hyperthermic and hot. Yeah, both things can actually make you very disoriented to the point if you're by yourself, you're you're not going to make it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you knowing your environment. So I would say heat, uh, the, the, uh, emergencies with, uh, the environmental emergencies, but then your water and your food, uh, especially hydration is so very, very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, food, you can go a little bit without the food, but water and your hydration, you, you can't go too long without that. And again, especially with your environment, if you have a warm environment, you can turn quite quickly within hours yeah. uh, to the point where, you know, you're going down a, a downhill slope and not, you know, not climbing a hill or anything. Uh, so I would say that's that's going to be what I would say I'm going to call the most important is your your temperatures, you know, being able to, you know, and even when you're talking about survival, being out in the woods, out in the wilderness, uh, in your environment, making sure you're prepared for that environment. Uh, you know, be prepared in case something does happen. You, you be prepared if you had to stay in the woods overnight or whatever. Right. Uh, do you have the right clothes? Do you have the right, you know, footwear, liquids? footwear, How many socks? times do you guys have to go and rescue somebody who <laughs> oh, doesn't have the right footwear? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that happens. It definitely happens, especially in our area that we're in, uh, dealing with the Canyon, you know, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to go climb down the Canyon to rescue somebody in, in your Crocs. Right. Uh, not going to be a good day for you. Right. Uh, so yeah, communication is sure important, right? Oh my telling, goodness. telling people where you're going. I'll tell you, communications you, is extremely. It's not important. like you had a recent incident where. <laughs> mm, and I'll tell you, especially in our area with the canyon and stuff, you know, communication is sometimes very difficult. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, making sure you're prepared with communications is extremely important. Like you said, you know, you might not have a radio with you to talk to somebody else. You always should probably have a partner if you're going out by, you know, in the woods right. or something. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, letting somebody know, hey, here's where I'm going, here's where I'll be, you know, so that if you don't show up, they have a general idea where you're located. So, yeah, communication. And, you know, the biggest thing with failure, you know, and one of the other jobs I, I do at the hospital is I was the emergency preparedness coordinator. And that was one of our biggest failures. Every time you do something, a drill or anything, it's all about communication. Uh, people's not knowing what the not, right hand don't know what the left hand's doing. Right. Yeah. How so. many, uh, even how many of the school shootings and, and active shooting situations got fouled up because yeah. there was not an established protocol for communication. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just, just getting back to, um, <coughs> maybe a lot of the guys that are watching don't know what happened to me recently in April. Mm -hmm. I had a, what would be considered a minor, it was a low, uh, low speed, motorcycle accident and it was on a rural property mm -hmm. and even even that nobody they knew i was out they didn't know what i was doing and i've i've ridden these trails a thousand times and still uh just had a situation where i hit some leaves the wheels kicked out and i ended up with the motorcycle leaning laying on me on a downhill slope and I could not get it off and my leg was pinned under the underframe and there I was. Yeah. Fortunately, I had my phone and I called Ellie and my wife. Ellie is our, our video editor extraordinaire and uh, neither one of them I actually could get. Fortunately, I had cell service, but I think at some point one of them uh, got a text. I texted, I called, and it was about 15 minutes that I was out there pinned mm. and came to find out I knew something was pretty bad, but 
They got the motorcycle off of me, pulled me out, and my ankle went, Ugh. flipped over to the right. Yeah. Figured something was wrong. And, and you know, and think about it, if nobody knew where you were, if nobody knew where you were at, I would have been there for a couple of right. hours. And you know, one of the one of least. the body's response and stuff is temperature. Yes. Uh, so your body, your your body heat can decrease, or your temperature can decrease. Yep. And again, you know, you're in you're in dangerous situations yep. there. So yeah. Yeah. Lessons learned for me was communication. One. Absolutely. Um, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. We want to normalize situations that are not normal. And we want to think like, hey, because I've hiked this trail or I've walked this way or I've done it like this and I've never been hurt that I'm not going to get hurt. And that's not necessarily the case. And fortunately, also, I couldn't be moved without having some wilderness EMT and just step Ellie and my wife through how to tear up rags and get mm -hmm. sticks and, and stabilize the ankle. So anyway, those are the sorts of things, just practical things we're going to talk about. Let's get back to this whole three minutes thing, mm -hmm. just like trauma, traumatic, um, airway issues, um, blood flow issues. Uh, you talked about stop the bleed, right? Right. Um, how vitally important that is. Um, and you know, airflow issues, which, um, you know, maybe, I don't know if you have any stories or any, uh, just maybe encourage, maybe encourage people even like, maybe part of my question is this, how do people take the first steps? Like, mm -hmm. let's just say, um, you know, they've, they've watched medical shows, <coughs> watching a medical show, comedy or a serious show or series on TV or on Netflix, does that prepare you for being medically prepared? No, it does not. No. <laughs> uh, Let's it go can, it can be the first step to maybe encourage you to get it. So the first thing I want to say, because I remember when I took my EMT class, uh, I was doing my clinical rotation. Mm -hmm. And we had somebody come in that had some kind of growth on their hand. And the doctor took it off while we were in the ER. And I remember getting so sick. And thinking to myself, what am I doing? Why am I even starting this career, getting into it? And just, thought, just because of sensitivity. Oh, like yeah. yeah. And I thought, I thought it was going to be over. So, you know, you might be one of those people that think, you know, what I cannot handle the blood, the guts. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I can do CPR, but I want to encourage you by saying this: you'd be surprised how your mind takes over when there is a true emergency. Uh, mm. so you might think that, you know, there's no way I can handle that. But when you have somebody that's there and they need your help, all that stuff goes out of your head. And all you think about is what do I got to do to help that person? Mm -hmm. So I want to say that because I want to encourage people, uh, as a first step is, you know, hook up with your local, uh, and everybody, everywhere has it, Red Cross, uh, the American Heart Association, they all offer, you know, basic first aid classes. And at least get that basic level. Have that basic knowledge of how you can uh, help somebody out. But also really get into the stop the bleed thing. I, I'm really into the stop the bleed class. So I like to tell the story that <clears throat> when my kids, uh, one was five and one was eight years old, uh, I was teaching a CPR class and they were like, I'd like to get in, you know, they were really interested in it. And I taught them at that age how to do CPR. Now, would they have been proficient at it? Probably not. But they probably could have coached somebody how right. to do it. Uh, but then... When Stop the Bleed actually came out, I really got involved with that program, and I seen how it works myself with using the hemostatic mm -hmm. uh, agents and tourniquets. Uh, that I taught my kids uh, all about it, and you know, to this day, all both of my I have two hunting kids uh, and myself, we carry uh, tourniquets and hemostatic agents in our our hunting bags. Yes, because you never know, you know, if you're going to come across somebody that fell off a tree stand or you yourself. Uh, you can save your own life. Uh, you can apply a tourniquet to yourself and save your own life. So it's so important, I thought, even if with my kids at that young age, to have that basic knowledge. Uh, you know, you might somebody, a listener out there might have a, a child, a teenage child that, that does babysitting on the side or something. Mm -hmm. You know, get involved with a, a, a pediatric first aid course or a pediatric CPR course. It really does make all the difference in the world to actually get involved with that. Uh, so like I said, you might think that, you know, maybe that's not for me. I'm not going to be able to handle it, but, you know, get that basic knowledge. You know, even if you have the intent, you'll never use it. I can tell you right now, if you end up in a situation where you need to, you will use it yeah. and you will remember, you'll yeah. remember what you were taught. Uh, so that's a great thing. And maybe the reverse side too, is if you're in that situation or if you have been in that situation 
you would feel powerless. I mean, you would, wouldn't you feel bad if you knew you could have had the training and something happened to a loved one or, or even just right. somebody who you didn't know, right. and you could have done something. And even like basic first aid, it is truly basic. Uh, yeah. Anybody can learn it. I mean, you don't have to have a high IQ of the best right. GPA in the world. You do not have it's, to. It's more, it's way more simple than people it is. realize. Yeah, it is. And I think when you do more hands-on in training and practicing, it brings it to light. I mean, you might actually read the pamphlet or read the book and, Oh, I just don't get it. But you know, all of our, all the classes with AHA with uh, with American at Red Cross, they all do. You know, you have a book. Yeah, you read through the book, but then you do practical. Right. Pra practical part brings it full circle. I mean, if you're a learner like me, I need my hands on to, right. to really learn. Uh, so yeah, it brings it full circle. So I, I think that you know, don't think you can't do it. You won't be able to retain the information because you will. You will. It is yeah. really basic. Yep, getting hands on is is a big help. Absolutely. Yeah, and I know the training that we did not too long ago. I was impressed with uh, the video, the video portion where they would show you, and then we would do it. Right. And that was super helpful. Yeah, and it, most of the programs, most all programs now are actually laid out that way, where you know you do a little bit of video, then you practice it. Video practice. Uh, it's, it makes for a longer class, but you know what? You definitely retain the information by the time you're done because there's a lot of repetitiveness yeah. as you're going through the class that you're going to remember it then. I don't know if we can do this, but if you guys are interested and if Andy says we can't, maybe you can encourage him so much that he will do it. But I mean, could we even, as we go through this whole series and we get to some specific uh portions could we actually do some demos for people absolutely okay. we can do and i can even because you've you. got the you've got the cool stop the bleed well, yeah, like thighs we, we where you, we can we can do that uh we've got the mannequin <laughs> or, you, or you can cut me open and actually <laughs> stop the bleed we can truly stop the bleed uh and and you know one thing i it's kind of a little funny joke i do when i do the the stop the bleed you know what we teach you the tourniquets can be put on extremities uh, and for the wives out there, no, you cannot put a tourniquet around a neck. That is not an acceptable <laughs> extremity. Uh, but even though we might think about it sometimes, but yeah, so yeah, we can, we can do that. Some other things I would even be interested in doing is bringing in some of the advanced technology. Okay. Uh, to show you. Or we could do AEDs. Too, we right? could do AED. There's actually a device that's fresh on the market and our county has them now. They're called a Lucas device. Hmm. Uh, it's actually a machine that completely does CPR for you. Uh, does the chest what? compressions. You don't do nothing. You just sit on the bench and let the machines do the work. But I'll tell you, the claim to fame for Lucas Device is perfect CPR, perfect depths, and perfect uh, compression rate, or rate, ratio. Huh. Uh, but, yeah, we could bring stuff like that in and kind of show you how that all, what what's out there. Okay. But I, the, I, the one thing I do, I like to really, I always like to teach kids. And I like to let the kids touch the equipment, especially mm -hmm. like backboards cervical collars so that you know if we ever have to pick them up in an ambulance and they're in an accident they're gonna not be afraid when we bring a collar and put something around their neck they right. go, oh i know what that is yep so i think it'd be a great idea and guys let us know in the comments what you think of this i think it'd be great if we can mm -hmm. legally like come come back and actually demonstrate some things for folks oh i think that'd be great go through all this Heck yeah. Yeah. yeah you so. can bring back some pretty neat equipment and kind of show you, show, yeah. show you what's out there. Show people how to use an AED, which is actually, oh, absolutely, yeah. again, that's another piece of equipment. There, there's kind of like a mystery. We're seeing them in more and more places. Shopping malls, right. uh, airports, everywhere you go. But there's kind of a mystery, like I'm going to give, administer an electrical shock, but I think we can take the mystery out of that absolutely. and encourage people then to go and get some certification, just get basic training, whatever, go, go as far as they want to go. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Nice. So what I'd like to do now, Andy, is why don't we just go through, okay, we've got average Joe, average Dave, right? I'm average Dave. And I haven't done any, maybe I had first aid training like 20 years ago or mm -hmm. something uh, for Boy Scouts or, or whatever, whatever it is. But, you know, I'm, I'm probably shouldn't be doing CPR because I don't know if it's 10 <coughs> compressions and 20 breaths or, you know, whatever it is, right? I wouldn't feel comfortable with it. Maybe what are some some kind of like first steps? Like let's let's just say like how how can you what can people take away and be medically prepared? And I guess I'm kind of thinking about the tiny survival guide and we're talking about like panel A and and just like the 
um, just some emergency preparedness things people can do now. One, if they get into a problem, right. people can, I guess, like identify them, right? Yeah. And, and all that, that sort of stuff and be able to take the next steps. What do people need to do? Let's just say um, Ellie, all of a sudden she falls on the floor. Yeah. What do we do? Well, so, you're here, so we. Well, hey, I'm here, so, <laughs> no, but I'm still going to do the same stuff because I'm alone, and that's the key. Okay, you never want to be alone. You need help. Everybody needs help. You know, whether it's to get the person to the hospital, lift them up off the floor, you need help. Right. Uh, so the best thing, the first thing you need to do is really assess the situation, and I, I just want to caution you to this: you want to make sure that number one, scene is safe. Yes. Uh, keep absolutely. in mind if you become a victim. You just did no good for that person that's laying on the floor. Right. Uh, I.e., let's just say they were working uh, along electrical panel or something and got electrocuted or there was wires laying. You know, is that a safe scene for you to go over and actually treat that patient? Right. So, number one. You're looking for hazards, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Look for hazards. Observational awareness. Absolutely. Scene yep. safe. Is the yep. scene safe? Okay, yep. Uh, you know, if you have available, you know, it might be different with family. But, you know, in the world today, you know, if you have uh, different uh, body uh, protection, like gloves or whatever, a mask or whatever, if they're available, gloves especially, you can wear Basically gloves. PPE. PPE. There, there you go. I was thinking BSI. What? BSI. <laughs> right, right, right. So what is PPE? PPE, personal protective equipment. Yep. So, okay. yeah. So we want to make sure we have that, that uh, our, our gloves on or whatever. But then you gotta, yeah, gotta ask yourself a few questions because you want to call nine one one. You want to get, to, you want to get help coming. So there's a couple things a dispatcher is going to ask you. So here's some things to keep in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, number one, how many patients are there? Is there one? Is it two? Is it ten? Because mm -hmm. that's going to determine how many people they actually get coming to the scene. So how many people? You want to consider the mechanism of, of injury or what mm -hmm. caused the injury. Was it electrical? Was it a, a drowning? Was it water? Uh, was it a motor vehicle accident? You need to know what caused it. Uh, and then some basic injuries. If so they can, would, uh, there's some acronyms yeah. here, MOI, right? This is what they normally go, mechanism of Mechan injury. Mechanism and of injury. And that just simply means like what was, what was the cause. What caused it, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yep. So yeah, so you know, was it an accident or whatever? Uh, know the location. Try to know the location. Uh, I've been on many situations where, and very recently, where it's been in the woods. And, you know, the woods in Tioga County are pretty darn big. Right. Uh, even if we narrow it down to, you know, uh, Middlebury town. Township or right, something right, right, like yeah. that. That's a big area. Uh, so kind of, if you can, have a general idea of, of, of you know, the location that's going to be at. So this even gets back to, you know, if you're going to go on a hike, know where you are. Take a paper map because so sure somebody, somebody knows where you're somebody going. Somebody knows where you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are some questions you really you really want to know. Uh, so location, you know, mechanism of injury, uh, number of patient, uh, the condition. You know, is the person breathing right now? Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you many situations where uh, I was dispatched to, you know, something that might I I can recall one and I can probably talk about it because this was back 20 years ago, where and it wasn't even in this area where I, I got dispatched for a person that was uh, had abdominal pain. And so we're thinking your typical abdominal pain. We don't really, you know, we'll maybe start an IV or, you know, cardiac monitor or stuff like that. But, you know, so we brought in our basic equipment into the house. When we got in there, it was a cardiac arrest. So mm -hmm. back out to the ambulance we had to go to get equipment for that. So know that a, a basic of what the injury is, that you can relay that to a dispatcher and say, hey, you know, uh, motor vehicle accident it looks like he's bleeding really bad from a leg or something like that. Uh, so yeah, so know that kind of information because that's some important, pertinent information to relay to a 911 dispatcher that okay. you need to know. Yep. Yep. And keep in mind also, I just wanted to yeah. uh, say this. Sometimes the dispatcher will keep you on the phone for a while because they got to get this information. Mm -hmm. But the this the dispatcher will get basic information from you right away, and while they're can they continue asking you questions. There's another person dispatching it. So don't think, I've been on the phone for 10 minutes and mm -hmm. they don't got mm -hmm. an ambulance com coming. They have, they literally dispatch it within a few seconds because they have somebody else working with them to do that. Right. So, And then they're going to ask you too, like what your name is and what, yeah. how to call you back. 
I yes. mean, do, I don't know. Do they actually see what your phone number is? When they can, but there's some areas, some phones and stuff that won't do that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's really. So you want to make sure that you don't you don't get off that call before they know who you are and how to contact. Don't you Don't hang right? up the phone until they tell you to hang up the phone. Okay. You know, and there's there's times you know I I teach a uh, a large group of uh, loggers and. The one thing we talk about quite often being a remote area is cell service. It's it's very skittish sometimes. And there's mm -hmm. times that, you know, if you can take the patient with you, and you learn this through training, if you can take the patient with you to go down to a place to call 911, that's great. But there's times you can't. You have to leave the patient. So, you know, there's just some things you'll learn as you would go through training and stuff. Uh, not every situation is spot on. There's right. always going to be hiccups. It's always variables. Absolutely. And there's things you don't know. But uh, you had you had mentioned taking a patient. And this this is a little bit more advanced. And we'll talk about this yeah. as we go through mm -hmm. the guide and as we continue to go through the series. But what what are some specific times maybe in general when you should not move a patient? Oh, absolutely. Good question. Uh, trauma. I'm going to say the big thing is trauma. So what is trauma? Just to so, find that for people. Just uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, so anything, so there's medical emergencies and there's trauma. Medical is your basic, your heart attacks, your stroke, uh, shortness of breath, uh, bee, a bee sting. That's a medical emergency. Trauma is something that would be caused like, like a, motorcycle a motor accident. vehicle accident, <laughs> right. uh, somebody yeah. falling out of a tree, uh, anywhere where you're penetrating, even, even penetrating the skin. So, uh, we talked about the loggers. I had a, I've had a logger that Blunt bounced force. a chainsaw. Absolutely. Okay. Bounce a chainsaw off his leg. That's trauma. So, uh, yeah. So in a situation where trauma, especially where there's a chance that there is a spinal injury, which are we x-ray machines? Can our eyes see through a body? No. So any kind of like a fall or anything like that, we have to treat that as there could be a potential spinal injury. Mm -hmm. So those are situations where, yeah, don't touch, hold, you know, encourage the person to move, uh, not to move, uh, to hold really still. Uh, and you, you, you know, as we go through things, you can, we'll, we'll teach this, you know, when you're approaching a victim that is a possible trauma, you never approach them from the back or the side. Because mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. start talking to them, what are they, you know, if you say, hey, I'm here to help you, what are they going to do? Yeah, right. they're, they're going to go like this. Right. You always want to approach from the front so they can see you and you approach by saying, I'm here to help you. Do not move. Mm -hmm. So that's stuff that we'll teach. But that's the big scenario, uh, traumas. You don't want to really move people that potentially uh, has, has a spinal injury. Uh, even something as little, you, know, you don't think about it all the time, but a pool. A diving injury. Somebody could have bounced off mm, the bottom mm -hmm. of the pool and, you know, have a spinal injury. Now, do we need to get them out of the water? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if there's any life-threatening areas that we need to safely, without compromising ourselves, remove them from, life over limb, basically. And if, if we need to move them and there's a chance they could have a spinal injury, if we can safely move them in a scenario where it's bad for them, they could be killed, uh, in that scenario, we're going to move them. So but that's stuff that we'll teach. Yeah. You can't, it's always best, it's always best to try to do what you can. I know there's a big fear in this world nowadays with, oh my goodness, I'm going to get sued. You know, anybody can get sued. I can get sued for doing everything perfectly right. But the big key is, did you do something? Did you act on behalf of the patient in the best interest of the patient? And sometimes moving them is the best interest of the patient. Right, right, right. So. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what's wrong with the patient. If they're in a burning building, that's going to fall in on them. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Or a motor vehicle accident that's catching fire. Right. You know, we're, we're, so the way we remove somebody from a motor vehicle accident is very cautiously protecting their spine. But if I go to a scene and the, the car is on fire, I'm grabbing a hold of them and I'm ripping them out of the vehicle. I don't right. care about at that point. You're not protecting the C-spine. You're protecting life. Right. So, yeah, And this gets where we talk a lot about mindset and situational awareness and things like that. Just practicing those things beyond the, the scope of maybe this podcast, but we'll get into that as it Absolutely. applies to what we're, what we're going through. So here's something that I think people can do now to ensure their, uh, their personal safety. Let's just say something happens. <laughs> Let's just say I'm riding my motorcycle and I have a wreck and I'm, unconscious and somebody finds me out in the woods mm. right so what i'm thinking of is like having emergency information on yep. me like what do you recommend 
for people to have on them so that you know they can do yeah. you, I mean do you recommend should so people, yeah so you know, what should people carry here so a couple things actually with that so you know diabetics heart problems they have mm. jewelry you can buy a bracelet um, you can buy necklaces there's many things they can buy and I wish I could remember it and if you want by the next time we meet I'll re I'll get the information the state police actually have a program out with a yellow uh, folder thing that goes in your glove compartment that actually has that pertinent information on it. And there's even a sticker, I believe, that will go on your window that tells you, hey, they got one of those. Uh, okay. So even in your own vehicle, in the glove compartment, that's a great resource. It's free through the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, so something like that can be done. But yeah, you want your basic health information. Uh, it's very important to know. Uh, blood type is extremely mm -hmm. important though. Think about this. If you're unconscious. So medications and allergies. And medications, allergies, and history, medical history. Okay. Uh, Even just short, like the big stuff. Yeah. Like I'm diabetic. Absolutely. And um, I'm allergic to pe uh, peanuts or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who your who your contact is. Yep. Uh, so if you're unconscious, okay. they know who they need to call to find out the information. And make sure that person knows your information. Uh, you need to find that one person that you trust and, and give them that information. Uh, sometimes it might even be embarrassing. A lot of people don't want people to know that they are diabetic or mm -hmm. they have a medical condition. But it's important to make sure somebody knows that that can relay that, re relay that to a hospital if they ever call. Yeah. So there's personal information. And then uh, should we have emergency numbers? Like, again, I guess it's important to have somebody... Something happens to you, who can people contact? But let's just say, um, like poison control center, or like emergency numbers. Uh, but we, most of us have cell phones, right? Absolutely. So when when you hit the SOS on there, is that always effective, or should we still carry a you know a little card with emergency numbers on it? You should definitely carry uh, a card. The other thing you can do uh, in all phones, they have the emergency contact. Uh, it's called ICE in case of an emergency. Okay. Uh, actually, if you look at my phone, I actually, my wife, instead of putting her name in there, I have her listed as ICE. So oh, like okay. when I call my phone or when I talk to my phone and say, hey, call, if I want to call my wife, I'll say call ICE. And that brings her number up right away. Okay. But I put that in there that way because to be honest, I've used it. I've used it a lot with uh, unconscious victims uh, pulling up their phone and looking to see if they have a contact. A lot of people do that. Uh, and they'll name it as ICE and it stands okay. for in case of an emergency. Okay. So, so the, you as a first responder are looking to it. see, hey, do Absolutely. they have any of yeah. this contact? Okay. Yeah. yeah I definitely. didn't know that. I don't I do not do that. And I'm going to do yep. it now. Okay. Like I said, my wife and everybody harasses me because I'll pick up my phone, call ICE, and they're, they'll ask crazy questions like, is that her, you know, is her heart cold like ICE? But no, no, it's not. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, but that's, that's something you can do. Uh, but yeah, emergency contact information is extremely important. And make sure they have good numbers and keep that up to date. You know, that's mm, something mm -hmm. you constantly should be looking at. You know, if you go to a doctor's visit and something changes, update that information. Uh, or if your contact changes, update that information. But make sure that person knows that you're making them part of your contact list. Okay. Yeah, that's right. important to know. Good. Yeah. Man, this is good stuff. Um, I'm thinking next time we talk about planning, preparing, and prevention. Yeah. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. So... I'd like to ask our guests, and I'm gonna just gonna I'm gonna call you a guest co-host, right? Okay. All right. Moving forward with this series, and I'm I'm really excited about this. I think even more so than just general basic wilderness survival or even urban survival, this is this is absolutely key to preparedness because there may be a time when you call 911 where you know emergency services are overwhelmed, right? maybe nobody's there. I mean, have you ever, maybe before we go, have you ever faced that where for some reason, emergency <laughs> services were not available? I have not. Okay. I mean, as an ambulance or the dispatchers? Just the, just, uh, people were, maybe it was a disaster event mm -hmm. and they're just, there were too many emergencies for our responders to respond to. We have. Yeah, we actually have seen that. But that's why, you know, in, in our field, in the, in the healthcare field, we have uh, mutual aids. So we all have we, every ambulance service, every hospital even has mutual aid agreements with other facilities or locations. Um, okay. And we've actually brought, even in our county, we've brought uh, uh, other services in to help us out. 
Uh, we have uh, in oh, our okay. in our county, yeah, we have some great resources. Actually, we actually have a bus uh, that's down in Williamsport that I believe holds seventeen patients. Uh, it's only like two years old, but we have mass casualty uh, type resources available. So resources, you know, real quick, you know, know your resources. What's in mm -hmm. your area? What's available to you? Uh, even as a layperson, you know, know what your county has. Okay. Uh, you know, when I first came here, you know, one thing I didn't realize, uh, one of our local towns had a hovercraft oh, and, okay. you know, living on Pine Creek, I didn't realize that when I had to get a person across Pine Creek and we had no idea how to do it because it was swiftly flowing. Uh, but then somebody said, well, let's get the hovercraft. It's like, wow, that's a pretty cool resource. Okay. So know your resources. Resources are important. Uh, know what's available to you to actually help you out at all times. So let me just ask you this while we're on it. How can people find out two things? One. Uh, how can they find training, basic training? Yeah. And two, how can they find out what resources are available to them? Yep. Uh, so for basic training, you can uh, go either on the American Heart Association website, which is aha.org, uh, or American uh, Red Cross. Okay. And they'll show you exactly where classes are. The other thing, I, I can talk more on behalf of American Heart because that's the one I'm the most familiar with, uh, and that's the one I'm certified through. Uh, but with the, with the AHA, the American Heart Association, go to your local hospital and ask them. They're a great resource. They'll be able to connect you into classes. Uh, but then past that, you know, you can, if you're interested in moving on uh, into, you know, basic first aid, uh, you can get that through, again, American Heart or, or the Red Cross. But if you want to go further, you know, there's three stages that you can go through, you know, and we can talk about this eventually if, if people are interested you know, first being a uh, uh, a first responder, uh, then we have uh, emergency medical responders in the EMR, then there's an EMT, and then if you want to advance, you can go into the paramedicine with paramedics. So there's actually an avenue where a civilian can Absolutely, can yeah. be trained to the point where they're kind of uh, a mini what? a mini ER. Okay. If you're in okay. the, if you're in the EMS, that's what they call the EM ones. They're a mini ER. Uh, if you look at the the drugs and the capabilities and the stuff that a paramedic that I that I've been trained to do, uh, we're a mini ER. We basically can do a lot that an ER does yeah. uh, to sustain life till we get them to a facility. So yeah, and and trainings, you know, for for the EMR, the very basic level, we're talking about sixty hours of training. Okay. Uh, the next level up is about four months of training, which is usually in our area, it's two nights a week. Uh, for three hours a night, that's for your EMT. And then your paramedic can be anywhere from uh, 12 months to, if you can do an associate's degree, and be two years uh, to finish it. So, yeah, there's different levels, but, you know, if it's something you're interested, start at the bottom, get, yep. your, get your feet get a little basic. wet. And then, like, a basic first aid course, that can happen in a day, oh, right? One day, yeah. We can do... A couple hours. Yeah, you can do... And actually, you're not just getting first aid. You could be getting first aid, you can get CPR and an AED. All that within a day, a period of time. So yeah, you know, one day you can get the basic knowledge, dabble in it a little bit to see if you like it. And, you know, maybe it's something you eventually want to make a career of, and it's rewarding. It really is. But regardless, it's going to make you more medically prepared. We'll make you more prepared, okay. even at the base, basic level. That's great. Before we head out of here, why don't you give folks maybe three, two or three, one, two or three action steps uh, that they can take now to be better prepared? You know, even this week. Yep. Before we get back to the next podcast. So I'm going to I'm going to go back to your information stuff. OK, first, get your information together. Uh, you know, another program uh, they have uh, vial vial of life. You can look it up on the Internet vial of life. OK, uh, it's a little magnetic card. that has a, or a magnetic holder that has a card in there that has you can put your basic information, your family physician. You put that on your refrigerator. Uh, EMS people look for them all the time. When okay. we go to a house, we'll look at a refrigerator. It's red, so it stands out, and that has all your medical information. So, first step: let's get your let's get your medical stuff lined up. Let's get your contact lined up uh, of who you, who's going to be your contact. Get your information available that somebody can easily find it, or somebody knows where it's at in case there's an emergency. Uh, so that's what I'm going to say is number one. Uh, number two, this one's going to be quite simple. I want you to get the mindset that you can do this. Mm, mm. Uh, so many people, like I said, kind of side and they, they won't do it because it's, I can never handle that. I, I'm, I'm no doctor. I can't be doing that doctor stuff. I'm not that smart. It doesn't take a lot to learn the basic steps that you need to do. 
and realize that, that is, that's going to be life-sustaining. Mm -hmm. The stuff you're going to learn is going to save somebody's life. Uh, so get that mindset. I'm going to put a number two, another number two in there also. Uh, first to aid be. kits and stuff. Okay. You know, yes. have a first aid kit readily available in your house. Not only in your house, in your car. I have them in my car. Uh, you know, eventually, if you learn CPR and stuff, if you look at my keys on my truck and my car, I have a little keychain that's a pocket mask. I have that stuff always available in mm -hmm. case you need it. So get yourself first aid kits. Have something basic or something that you can have ready. Even if you don't take any medical training, everybody knows how to apply a Band-Aid. Uh, everybody probably knows how to apply gauze. So even that basic stuff, have that stuff available in your homes. It's easy, easily found. And lastly, what I'm going to say to prepare is uh, look on the Internet. Look for the American Heart Association. Look for American Red Cross. Uh, comment on, on the, the, the site here uh, with Dave uh, that's something you're interested in. You can easily find classes, and they do, they do not take a lot of your time. It does not you take one day of your time. And think about that. That one day could save your loved one's life. It definitely could save your loved one's life. So think about that as you go along. Uh, I'm going to throw in a couple of things too. Yeah. Okay. One, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from the tiny guide and I'm going to make it into uh, kind of like an outline format for people that they can get. So you, if you want all this emergency information and the basic outline of what we talked about, kind of, uh, you know, make sure that you're clear of hazards and all that sort of kind of stuff. You can get the notes for this. We're going to have them on ultimate survival tips.com and just look in the podcast tab and show notes. Okay. So we'll have that there. And what I'm also going to include is everything that you just said, including links to uh, links to these websites where yeah. people can sign up for classes, see what's available in their area. Uh, the tiny guide actually has all of this in it and it's a good kind of, it, it's beyond like a good preview, but it's certainly a reminder, something that you can start reviewing even with your kids. It's all family friendly. And uh, the American Red Cross actually has a, has a uh, cell phone app. So I'll give people the, the links to that if they want to go to ultimatesurvivaltips.com. Click on that podcast tab, show notes, and then you can grab all this stuff that we're talking about today. Excellent. Excellent. Dude, thank you so much for oh, hey, it's being my, here. My so, pleasure. So are you in? I'm in. We're gonna, I'm in all we're the gonna way. Go, all I mean, the way in. We're talking about, you know, over the course of the next couple of months, maybe 12, 14, 15 podcasts we'll work in. Excellent. No, we we'll definitely do it. I think it'd be a great thing to do. Andy, thank you so much You're for being welcome. here. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah. thanks to the listeners. I yeah. appreciate it. So guys, that was great. Uh, I really appreciate Andy. And if you like this podcast and you like this video format, where you guys are listening via audio, we are posting these podcast videos on YouTube now at Ultimate Survival Tips on YouTube. Also, paid forward. You need to get this information into your the hands of your friends and family. Also, one thing that you can do is like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and share this podcast. Three things you can do. Also, don't forget about the show notes over at ultimatesurvivaltips.com. Find the podcast tab, click show notes, and you'll go right to the show notes for this podcast. Guys, I think that's about it. Thanks for joining us today. Until next time, keep it simple, stay positive, and be sharp. Thank you.